Mike, how are you doing? Thanks very much for joining me today. Um, we are kind of uh, old pals in a sense. We've been around each other for quite a bit. So I just yep. wanted to um, do this because basically I always consider you one of uh, Britain's best kept secrets. And Mike Jackson, Man City fan, just finished your sports um, nutrition based diploma. Well done on that. And you, we're flying yeah. colours too. I've trained Robbie Reed, Scott Quigg, um, have done cuts for uh, Tyson Fury. Also worked with Matthew Hall and then you, uh, was it Gary Lockett? You mentioned Gary Lockett, I think it was, you mentioned as well. And numerous yeah. others. Um, we had so, the gym at the same time. Okay. So how are you doing? I'm fine. Well, you look fine. You look relaxed. <laughs> Sun shines on us. <laughs> hey, tell me something. Uh, how have you buried up? How's been uh how's the whole experience of COVID? Uh same as everyone really, just waiting for it to uh ease off a bit. But when it kicked in in the dark days, we were both off work and it was all right. But my wife went back to work before me. She's self-employed. And that's when it really hit me because I was here on my own. I had the dogs, but it was it was boring. It weren't the same, and I did miss her. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Lynette Jackson. <laughs> you you have worked for how many years in boxing? Twenty odd. I couldn't put my finger on it really. the The first major fight I was involved in was Robin Reed, Joe Calzaghe. Um. I did shows before then, but that was the first big one everyone would remember. Mm -hmm. And on the night, it didn't go to plan because we had Darren Rhodes, who was only, he may have been having his debut, I can't remember, but his fight got put back. He was what's called a floater. And in the end, when Robbie came to box, Darren was a bit nervous and Brian said, would I stay in the back with Darren and keep him relaxed and calm? He had monitors so we could watch the fight. So I didn't actually do his corner for that fight because I was looking after our other lad and he didn't actually get on in the end. They run out of time. Well, a real testimony of any coach is having the humility to not want to be in front of a camera all the time as well. And any coach that's worth their salt knows that the best place to be is at the side of an athlete, particularly before they box, because yeah. it's the most extreme or the most intense time for athletes and if left to their own devices that can be a really let's just say it can leave a very negative mental imprint on a footer before they go if they're in the dressing room on their own just pacing up and down waiting for the coaches yeah. to come back yeah we couldn't do that to him no it was either his debut or his, his second fight it was it was early in his career anyway right because so, he'd actually been to another fight and it got called off on the night because the opponent's father died. So he was having no luck whatsoever at this stage. So we had to make sure he was all right. Yeah, that was nice. That was nice. Well, good on the two of you. So how did you start? I used to train at Colliest. Um, I was never good enough because if you've ever been in a ring with a boxer, you know how fast they are, accurate they are. And I didn't have the temperament. I just wanted... I just read mist. Worst thing you can have being a boxer. And I was no good. But I used to enjoy the training, used to enjoy the crack. And Brian was on his own at the time and he asked me, would he help train the fighters? And I pointed out to him that he wasn't experienced. Um, and he, he said, it's ideal. He said, I've seen you with the lads. They respect you, they like you. You'll learn and you've got your own ideas. So it's just see how it goes. So I actually trained him with him for about 12 months. And then he told me to get my license because he wanted me in the corner. And that's how I got into boxing. Professional boxing, that is. Yeah. Never had, I'd never had anything to do with the amateurs. And the reason for that is I've seen a lot of good kids drift away from the sport because they've been robbed by these judges who don't give it a, a second's thought. Yeah, you know, if it's the home show, you've got to knock them out to get a draw. So, and when they're not getting paid and they're only kids, it's hard telling a kid it, it don't matter when they've lost. 
because it matters to them. Mm. It matters to everybody when win, lose, or draw. But as you get older, you understand more, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, win, lose, there's an acceptance in athletic boxing, whether it's national or international, that, you know, sometimes you're on the, the end of a bad decision. You take it on the chin, you take it like a gentleman, and you walk away. And having been involved with in Rio myself, all I can say is from the get-go, when you see results come in as they did, they make your stomach torn if you're a true boxing man because you don't want any part of it. You don't want your name to be a part of it. It was for me, it was the it was, you know, like standing in Rio Stadium with 80,000 people with the Olympic blazer was the proudest, one of the proudest moments of my life. But then when you've seen what was happening, it was just yeah. too hard to stomach, you know, and then go sit at the same table as the officials that have been given the decisions. It was horrible. If you're a true yeah. boxing person, true and true. Uh, and I, I always remember Emmanuel Stewart saying once that, um, you know, amateur boxing is by far one of the most corrupt, corrupt sports in the in the world. That was Emmanuel Stewart's comment. Well, look at uh, what happened to Bill Jones. Yeah, yeah. Well, being around them myself, it's 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 hard. So I totally get what you what you mean. Yeah. So how did you gravitate? So okay, you, you've come into uh, to you, you've you've given up boxing, or you've realised that it's not going to go anywhere quick. Right? Yeah. You turned to coaching. Uh, True Brian. Can you give me Brian's full name for anybody that doesn't know who he is? Brian Hughes, the godfather of Mancunian boxing. Ah, uh, no. Uh, Brian Hughes, right? So yeah. now you're walking alongside of Brian. And what was it like in the early days? A lot it of travel, good. a lot of back and forth. Going, going up and down the country, um, seeing... We could be walking down the street, any any city of any any way you could mention, and he would be recognised. And he hated it because he wasn't a big head. He didn't have an ego. He just wanted the quiet life and the best for his lads. And to be with him, we could be having a meal in a hotel, and he'd say, "You're the best waitress I've ever seen," or "You're the best waiter." And they'd probably heard it all before, but coming from it, it they just they just felt great. And we used to get looked after. It's 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 a real um it's very rare today that you would have somebody in his position with the same kind of humility. Humility is not something you see too often out there anymore. It's because we've become yeah. social so social media orientated and it seems like the more nasty you are in social media, the more recognition you get for it, or it just seems social media feeds seem so angry today. Had Brian, I, I dare say Brian doesn't, well, he probably has a Facebook account or maybe he hasn't, I don't know, maybe he just puts his gym stuff up there and doesn't put any personal accounts on uh, social media and stuff. No, he was always a very private person, to be honest. So, so he was a good mentor for you to start with. Oh, yeah. And I watched him in the corner. We used to have um, a system where, he taught me a lot of really good lessons what I've took all the way through my career. And one was one voice in the corner. So if I had anything to say, we'd talk about it during the round. And if he agreed, he'd pass it on. If not, he wouldn't. Or he might say maybe towards the end of the fight. And I was, I was always, I didn't say a word in the corner because I respected him that much and what he said made a hell of a lot of sense um i watched him do cuts saw some terrible cuts but the way we used to do it he used to say i'll do the cuts you do the swelling now don't know if you ever seen robin reed box but he used to swell for fun he had these model playboy looks but he did use to swell up and there was one particular fight and i said brian i feel as though it's gonna burst and and you know I, he went well if it bursts there be no problem because the swelling will go. The blood will run down his face. It, it, and I thought, you know what? what? <laughs> it's common sense. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Lockett, he used to hold his guard up and his own gloves used to mark him. So we had a lot of practice with, with them two alone. 
mm. but it, it was good and you can only learn by actually doing it on on the job you you know it's experience and you can't buy it no no and so how many years were you in salt with brian Roughly 15, 16. It was a long time. Time. I was, yeah, there, time. I was there, for instance, from the start of Michael Jennings' career all the way through to um, his last fight against Kel Brook. So there's one full career. Uh, I was there the first 19 fights of Scott Quigg's career before he left Colliers when Brian retired. And what, what I must say about the boys back then, they were all so loyal. Thomas McDonough stayed with him till the end. Matthew Wall did. Robbie Reed did. Robbie could have walked a few times because he had some dodgy decisions and he could have blamed Brian. He could have blamed anyone by himself, but he didn't. He said, you know what? That was that was Robert, but I'll I'll prove him wrong. And loyalty goes a long way with me. And I'll, I'll never forget that. They're all school pr principles, unfortunately. All uh, of them. Yeah. yeah, old school principles. Yeah, absolutely. Don't you find out that the generation now, I don't want to generalize. There are some good kids out there and there are other kids that just everything's disposable. Um, they've no real concept of the consequences of losses, the consequences of how they win. Like you can have a good win and you can have a bad win in the sense that, you know, people have fell asleep watching your box kind of thing. And equally, yeah. you can have a good loss in the sense that it was toe to toe and it came down to a you right, know, yeah. split decision, but it puts bums on chairs. People want to come and see it again, you know, and then you can have a bad loss where if you are put in with a step up in your career and you don't even go three rounds, four rounds with them, you know, it's not that you're yeah. overmatched, it's probably, it's, you just probably couldn't cut the mustard at that level. And you see kids jumping from trainer to trainer and, th and thinking that geographics will make it better. Now, sometimes the jump is warranted, but other times you'll see kids, they don't really, you know, they haven't let the dust settle. They haven't learned the game. They need to, you know, piece by piece, put it together piece by piece. Yeah. What? Well, what's it, the most sorry. I was going to say it's true because Brian used to always say, we can get him a title next month, but he won't keep it because he's not had the education. He's not been knocked down. He's not been cut. He's not been in a war. He's never been past eight rounds. The, the, all these that you've got to tick the boxes as you go along. And if you've not ticked the boxes when you come to the top, you can't stay there. I don't care who you are, you won't stay there. Yeah. So it's just the way it is. Okay, so what did you bring to the table? Because what I'm hearing from you, you're talking about Brian, and, and I get you have a ton of respect for Brian. But what did you bring to the table? Just different ideas on the, the circuits and stuff like that, because I was... You mean circuit I was training really... or the circuit in terms of Britain? Circuit training or do you mean the circuit in Britain? Dif well, he was old school. He had his set, set exercises, but I, I just mixed it up a bit. But to be honest, most of the time I was with Brian, I was learning off him. I was uh, my, I was watching everything and taking it all in. But I was more aggressive than Brian. Brian's probably the best defensive coach there's ever been. And if I was trying to bring my aggression to the table, he'd say, "Well, just not yet." And he was per he would he picked the perfect moment to bring that aggression into a fight. Oh God. Or whenever. So, very, very clever man. Right. So, it seemed like a good balance between the two of you. Well, he didn't lose, lose his temper that often. I lost it a lot quicker than Brian. And when he lost his temper, people knew they were in, in the, the Maya sort of thing. I won't, I'll try not to swear. But I used to collect the subs, for instance, and I was face to face with more than one, <laughs> more than one occasion. Uh, and I used to say, "You've got to pay your subs. It's only a tenner a week. If you're here five days a week, it's two quid a session." And I say, "Did you go to the pictures last night?" Yeah. 
I said, well, go tonight, see if they'll let you in for now. Doesn't work. And at times the gym did struggle to pay the bills. So it was important to get that money in. So we were you a know, good balance. No, I was just going to say to you, I don't think people really truly understand. Uh, people who are not involved with boxing or haven't worked boxing full time or any particular or ran gyms, regardless of combat sport, the type of combat sport, just how much, well, let's put it this way. First of all, I, I just want to say that boxing's always been cheaper than any other combat sport that's out there. When I, I, when I was a kid, it was like, it was like one pound, one pound a week, 50, uh, 50 pence a week. Uh, then I went up to a pound. And boxing's always been a working class sport. Now you've got other combat sports, I won't name them, but they, they appeal to middle classes because they've other disciplines besides just, you know, uh, uh, punching or yeah. full contact striking to the head and body. Uh, there's other disciplines out there. Considerably more expensive than boxing. But you'll always find a boxing gym and somebody's in, always in working class and underclass areas in, 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 in the backyard, really in the thick of it. And we've supplied yeah. community um, service, uh, a, a service in the community, you know, for all of those who've ever wanted to, you know, it has been a service within the community itself. Yeah. But it's just, I don't think people fully understand the amount of time and energy you give to the gym, number one, and then having to struggle to pay the bills at the end of the day and maybe take a wage off that too. Now, in terms of the wages, like, I'm not asking you how much or anything like that, but no, I know... No, yeah. no, it wasn't. Back then, I was in the, the chemical industry and my shift pattern allowed me to be in the gym at least twice a week. Uh, okay. But I used to get 17 days off every 10 weeks. So I was there, and if we had fights, it was always the opportunity to swap shifts. So I never missed a fight. I just, I just had to pay the shifts back. When we right. flew back to New York after Mike uh, bought Cotto, we landed in Manchester at 10 in the morning, and I had a night shift that night, six, six while six the following day. So I've, I've come home, got off the plane, a few hours at home, and gone to work. And I'll never forget it. I was getting my boiler suit on, getting ready to go on the plan. My phone went, and it was Mike Jennings, and he went, enjoy your shift, mate. I thought, <laughs> you little <laughs> but It is a working man's sport, you're right. And this is the kind of thing. A lot of boxers have to work because they can't, they can't not work. They've got to pay the bills. They don't earn enough off boxing. Yeah. People don't see it. They, back then, you had to go around the pubs putting posters up and make phone calls it's a lot easier now with social media and it a lot of it is is a, a doddle really and you don't have to work to to get that following what you did back then yeah absolutely and i think as well there was a lot to be said for going and doing cold sales like door-to-door -door stuff selling yourself so you can you know you can yeah. build up your own fan base i mean kids today think that they post a few pictures in social media feeds it's enough to build a fan base you got to be kidding. It doesn't work like that. You know, people yeah. in your local community, you start off locally, you build up from that, and you go out and out and out from there. People think it's going to land on the lap just because they post a few photographs of them in a the corner or boxing or something like that, you know. But um, have, have you seen many changes in the game over the, uh, the period of time, over the course of time you've been involved in it, Mike? Yeah, I have. We've, we've touched on the social media. That's been the biggest change. Um, nutrition. <laughs> water was king for us. You know, yeah. we, we all did the tap running, the water was going, but what we didn't realise back then, but what we realise now is all this nutrition you can buy now, it saves so much time and effort and you're getting, obviously, the right nutrients and in a close fight, that could be the difference. So not just boxing, nutrition's coming into all sports. So that was one of the reasons why I went down that route. Right. I'm just gonna I'm gonna dig something up now in a second because I wanna I, I wanna chat to you about this. So nutrition was something you kind of you found that there was a let's just say 
uh, there was something lacking within the sport itself in terms of knowledge, in terms of people having a solid base and. Well, yeah, I was lacking in the knowledge. Yeah. I'll be honest with that, but I was always too busy to investigate. And then when COVID come and I came out of work due to no fights, I thought, you know what, now's the time. So I'm actually qualified in sports nutrition and also diet and nutritional advice as well. Amazing. So, I just put your cert up there. You probably you can't see it, but it's up there. Center of Excellence. Every Sarah Tafoy is Michael Jackson, sports nutrition business diploma with distinction. Not everybody gets distinctions, Mike. Well done. 98%. Yeah, only 90 odd percent. What was it, 98 did you get? 98 overall, yeah. Yeah, what happened there? How come you blew it? <laughs> I don't know. Two percent, Mike. What did you do? Forget to, to uh, cross the T's and dot the I's or something for that. You lost two percent yeah. on grammar or something. Must have been just a few words too short on one of the essays. Sure. That's what it was. Look, not every, yeah, they probably were conscious. They didn't want to give every uh, give you a hundred percent. You know, 100%, yeah, can't do that. That's too perfect. You know, you just knock them off. But I, what I want you to do is, I'm going to throw a few um, uh, pictures on screen. Now, it's a pity you can't see them, but I'm going to throw a few up there so um, other people can see them. Um, so I have a couple of pictures for you. Um, I'll just throw them up now in a second. Uh, I have Brian and Collier here. Right, okay. Tyson Fury. People are now Tyson, right? So you've yep. been around Tyson on and off for how many years? Uh, it's in the record books. He, he bought a German called Blasco, uh, yeah. and he trained with us for about six, seven, eight months for that fight. Okay. And then after that fight, he moved on. But if well, you how did you end up the, doing cuts with him? How did you end up doing cuts? He was in the Hatton gym for 12 months training with Ben Davidson and his dad was in one day and he, he was mention. talking about the upcoming fight and they mentioned cuts and Big John said, oh, Mike can do cuts. So he said, can you? So I said, yeah. He said, right, you've got the job. So he'd already, he, he'd asked Ricky Hatton to go in the corner as well. Yep. And I, I was his assistant at the time, so it just it just all fit in. It was a good night. Yeah, he didn't need a cut, man. The fellow in his first fight back weren't going to really trouble him, but you've obviously got to have one in case. And yeah, it was a good atmosphere. Okay, uh, you've been. You said you were with certain people from day one. You said Jennings was one of them, correct? Michael Jennings, yeah. Michael Jennings, what was that like? You've been, been through uh, with a guy for how many years? I'm not sure how many years his career was, but he uh, he started out, uh, he knocked someone out in Blackpool in the first round in his debut after telling us he wasn't a puncher. And then he went quite a spell without stopping anybody. And it, it did concern him because he, he mentioned it and he was a bit upset about it. And Brian said, look, you're fighting good, good journeymen. And you're giving up to a stony way in weight. So you're getting the education. When you start boxing for titles and they weigh the same as you, trust me, you'll start stopping them. If you don't yeah. knock them out, you'll cut them. And if you look at his record, that's exactly what happened. Mm. <laughs> Every time he, he stopped Ross Minter, who was a good lad, um, he stopped Chris Alimentos Saunders. Alimentos son, Alimentos yeah. Son, yeah. He stopped uh, Chris Saunders from the Ingle Gym. He was a good lad. Um, he stopped Jimmy Vincent in a round to win the British title. So, yeah, he did well. I think he stopped to, he stopped quite a few on cuts as well, just just like Brian said. So, yeah, it was it was good. I know I can hear so much respect you have for Brian every time you open your mouth and you speak about the man. I mean, that in itself speaks yards for the guy and the influence he had over yourself. I have a picture I'm just after pulling up there. Zanet. Is it a little... Is he yeah. a Kazakh? Is he a Kazakh or a Russian kid? He's Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Yeah, he looks Kazakh. So tell me something. How long were you with uh, Zanet? Uh, about three years. How that came about, we used to promote him, Hatton Promotions promoted him. And... 
Rick went over to Hong Kong to watch him box and he, he splattered someone in like two rounds. And then they brought him over to Blackpool of all places. He stopped a good journeyman, Anwar Alfredi, I think he was called. And his trainer was this old guy and he passed away. And then his manager, Philippe Fondue, approached Ricky Atten to say, would you like to train him? And he said, no, not kidding. But when he come to us, he was very, he was just seek and destroy. He just wanted to kill everything in, in front of him. So we had to strip him back and show him boxing, moving his head in and out, you know, boxing skills, what he never, he never had. He used to rely on his brute force. And he, he went over to America and beat a very, very slick, fast operator in Roche Warren to win mm -hmm. the world title. So all the, the work, what we put in, was on show that night, and he did it in the guy's home state. He, so, well, just tell me, right, so Collier's gym had closed by then, and yourself and Brian no, then? No, how it come about, I left Collier's when Brian retired. Um, I, I hung around for about six months, and it was never the same. It just wasn't the same without Brian for me. Um, mm. And I went watching a show in Chester with Pat, Pat Barrett, who now runs it. And I told him about the chance they had of working at the Atten gym. And he, he, he said, go for it. So we left on good terms. And to this day, we're, we're best of mates. Um, Collis, believe, believe me, he's going strong. They've got two Commonwealth champions there at the minute, Zelfa Barrett and Lyndon Arthur. Collis has been going over 100 years. And it was wow. probably there 100 years. He actually brought a book out. Um, and quite a few people in the book had their own chapters. And I was one of them. Looking oh, to be nice. involved. Nice. Mm -hmm. So, so you cross over. You're now in Ricky Hatton's gym. So, who were you working with specifically in the corners? Uh, we had Zanet, like we mentioned. We've had Sergey Rabchenko, who won the European oh, title. In terms of the coaches, the coaching staff. The coaching staff was myself, Ricky Hatton from the start, and then later on, Blaine Eunice come on board as well. Okay. Okay. So with Zanet, I seen he had a loss there against Ryan Barnett. Um, yeah. Okay, that's a tough fight for um uh, for anybody. Ryan Barnett's yeah. uh, you know. So were you with him on that fight or? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was in his corner. Uh, we felt on the night that he'd lost it by two or three rounds. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, but the scores were a joke, and I think the scores sickened Zanet. And that was his last fight. Okay, he retired after that. He did, yeah. Because I think it was his birthday that the fight was October, but he was 34 maybe the next month. And at that weight, you know, it's a young man's sport more than ever. And yeah, yeah, he, for sure. He ended up uh, in charge of boxing for Northern Kazakhstan region, working for the government. And he's, he is a big star out there. He's what Be David Beckham used to be over here. He's a major right. star in Kazakhstan. Right, okay, okay. Yeah, they have a deep down respect for boxing, same with uh, now MMA, judo also. The Kazakhs are massive in judo as well. Um, it was the second two days to get home. <laughs> it was yeah, two yeah. fights. And mm -hmm. he was on a train about 19 hours. And the whole... I've been Astana. Yeah, well, he used to fly into Astana and then he, he was trained from there. It was about 19 hours and he was all waiting for him getting off the train. Here as well. Yeah. You can't imagine how different the worlds are. You know, coming from a place like Kazakhstan to, to live in Great Britain. Uh, I, I've been in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is very modern. It's a very new yeah. country by the looks of it. I mean, the amount of money and wealth and it's unbelievable. I don't know what I was expecting when I got off over there, but when I seen Astana... Um, it was just, you know, it just it was the last thing I expected because it was so modern. I, I was expecting something yeah. older, something more Eastern Bloc, old school kind of stuff. But it's a testimony to the type of, if you look now at the amount of fighters, even in the UFC, the amount of fighters coming even from Eastern Bloc countries, it's a testimony to that system of boxing that they use, the Russian technical system of boxing that they endorse. That same system's ingrained 
in in most of the athletes and that same discipline that same focus you know they're, they're, i have to say walking in um eastern Bloc countries has been in a you know an eye opener for me i'm just thinking well, I, as well i, I used well, to say sorry. we don't I used to say we don't train him, we program him because yeah. we tell him something and that was it, he got it. Yeah. He picked it up. <laughs> yeah, instantly. And, and what yeah. a genuine grateful fella he was. Everything he, he received, like it could be a hat for doing his runs. He'd, he'd be like, oh, thank you, thank you. And no, he was such a nice fella. I was just going to say that. Still in touch with him now, sends me ah, videos. Really? Yeah, brilliant. Um, I was just going to say the first two months I spent in uh, Azerbaijan, I didn't have to open a door for myself. People would run in front of me and open the door for me and say, please, yeah. please, please. Just so manly. Um, you also worked with Chris Blaney, Ginger Ninja. I did, yeah. Yeah, an Irish, an Irish connection. Wouldn't be the first one or the last one you've had since you. And no. you were with him for, was it Craig McCarthy? You done cuts in his corner, didn't you? I did, yeah. Worst cut I've ever had to deal with. It was it was like two rams butting each other. Um, it was Chris's own fault, and I did tell him while we were sat in A&E, why go for a big right hand when you ain't got a big right hand? He had lovely boxing skills, and he should yeah. have boxed his head off. And they were both falling in, and the inevitable happened, and that cut required 28 stitches. Wow. But I managed to stop it. And oh. we we got him sorted out. But oh, nice. then COVID come and the rematch never happened. It was down for Craig's hometown, Walterford. Mm. We was going to go over there and have the rematch, but it didn't come off because of COVID. I remember you travelled over. We connected before you, I think it was after or before, I can't remember. But there was uh, other combat sports on that show as well, wasn't there? I think... Was that the one? It was uh, the world title um, kickboxing on my yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, it was for the that. WBC title. It was the same belt what they give out in boxing. Yeah. I didn't. I weren't aware of that. Well, you've all, you you've also worked with Scott Quick. Yeah, very very dedicated. Very very yeah. dedicated. Phenomenal athlete. Yeah, they just got when you look at the fights, even with John O'Carroll. What's your opinion on that one? I think Asia's caught up with him, to be honest. Yeah. I think no disrespect, disrespect to John O, but I think a younger Scott Quigg wins that fight every day. Yeah. He's a, he's a, he was beautiful. He was a great technician to watch. He was his defence as well. He was very good at riding shots and coming back with his own. He was very hard to it. He, he had a good jab, good feet. Yeah, he, he was a good boxer, Scott was. And the beautiful one I was... I was I was intrigued with it because I'd seen a, a few bits and pieces on it and I wanted to kind of Paul, I can't even say his name, Economides, is it Econom Economides? He's exactly. Pat Greek. Pat yeah. Greek. Right. And he boxed against a kid called Gavin McDonald. Gavin McDonald, wasn't it? Yeah, it wasn't in his corner then. Um I I do his cuts because how that come about, Steve Goodwin, his trainer in Chester, used to work with his colliest. He used to do pads, and he did the corner for us for a few years as well. And then when he got his own gym in Chester, he asked me would I do the cuts for any of his lads. And I said, of course I will. So it's good to stay in touch with people, you know. Sure. The crux of it is, I think... Paul won the Solaria title, and yeah. that was a good one. Now, be, the, what I'm looking at, when you, when you look at most fighters' records, I mean, they're squeaky clean until 15. And then after that, they're released to a whole different level of boxing. It's like yeah. levels in boxing. You start learning your trade over the first 15. But one of the biggest, I think, Achilles heels were boxing our career professionals, the number of titles that are out there. I'm a boxing man true and true, and I love the sport. I love it with my heart and soul, as you do. And one of the reasons I always gravitate towards you, or any time I've met you, we, we come from similar schools of thought around boxing. But when you when you look 
at the whole ethos, the importance of zero records. It's absolutely destroyed boxing, career professionals, 68 different world titles. It just goes on and on. You've got four main titles, the WBA, WBC, WBO, IBF, and minor titles, the WBU and the IBO. Like, yeah. it, it's just we've, we've diluted it, but now the evolution of it seems to be like franchise-style boxing, where companies are taking boxers and they're keeping them within their own bubble. Yeah. And, and because of contractual agreements, you're not really getting to see fights you'd like to see. <clears throat> or they're navigating around fights that would be entertaining for the public to watch. Um, I don't know. I think somewhat we've uh, it, it's evolved. I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but boxing's changed in, in the 10 year period I've been involved with MMA, true MMA, and then back to boxing. What's your opinion? Well, there's been too many fights that have been lost to, to time. For instance, when Pacquiao boxed Mayweather. Nobody really was interested. It should have happened five years before. Amir Khan, Kelly Brook, who cares now? It's gone. Yeah. And we're in, we're in danger of another one falling by the wayside with Tyson Fury and AJ. Yeah, yeah. And on and on and on. And this is what turns a lot of people off boxing. I mean, I've never been into the UFC, but look at the crowds he get. Look at the business mode they've got they've got Dana White who's in control and they've got one champion for every weight but if you fight and you get beat you're not you're not dead in the water as long as you provide entertainment he'll have you back yeah. so they're not worried about losing all they're worried about is getting a shot and the only way they'll get a shot in that is by giving their all and entertaining and doing the business but in boxing, like you've said, you can hide behind a padded record so 15, 20 fights down the line. Mm. But you're kidding yourself. Yeah. If you've got a pro you believe in, you should let him off the leash. And All right, we'll see. We'll see what he can do. And if it goes wrong, if he's, if he's good enough, he'll learn off that and he'll come back stronger. And it's part of the education. But a lot are not prepared to have that education. It's modern yeah. day society. If there's a new phone out next week, all these kids want that phone now. You don't want to save up for it like we had to. They want it now. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and we can't change society. It's just the way the world's gone. Well, when you look at boxing, like when you got, say, say if you took the WBA or the WBC or something as an example. You've got the super champion, the regular champion, the interim champion. Then you've got inter the intercontinental champion or European champion or regional champions of various, all under the same belt. Like, it's just confusing. So you've got a super it's champion. You've got a it's, it's down to money because yeah, of every, what people don't realise, every one of them belts, you've got to pay a sanctioning fee to fight for that belt. So it's purely down to money and rankings. And then, and then when you look at then Ottawa Wilder versus Tyson Fury, I'll use that as an example, right? And then you've got a situation where somebody walks into a member of, I think, BT Sports. It could be wrong. So walks into um, Ben Davis, walks over to Ben Davis while the fights, while the fights on. And tells yeah. Ben Davis after round, round four, because Tyson has a really nasty laceration, which should have been stopped, by the way, because it, it, it was a parallel cut or perpendicular cut, two of them, and yeah. told him not to stop the fight. When did that start to happen? When did, you know, outside entities start to have an opinion? I know they were always there, but it was a little bit more subtle than that. But now you've got a guy from the media or from the promotional or the promotion itself Telling you not to stop the fight. You should. Oh, Katie, listen to this. He don't want him to stop it. He's enjoying it. <laughs> well, he wouldn't have done it with someone like Denny Mancini or, or Brian for that matter. Yeah, because I know what they just said. Yeah, yeah, I know what they just said. I want yeah. to bring you back to your new venture. We're going to just jump back into the new venture and yeah. stuff. 
So the name of your nutrition company is called Marshall. Is that correct? It's going to be Marshall Sports Nutrition. Okay. And how's that going for you so far? You put it up on social media feeds. You've had a very positive response. I have, yeah. So what I've done since then, I've looked into um, all the boarding stuff like websites and telephone systems, payment systems. Um, I've had a, a call from America asking me to work with fighters over there. Not That's going really, over there. You know. Really good. Um, so it, it's somewhat what, it's not off the ground yet, but I'd be stupid not to act on what I've, I've been doing in the summer. Um, and it, it keep us involved in the, in the sport, if not boxing, I'd be looking at maybe getting into a football club or two, uh, cause if they've got players pre-season coming up. Uh, I'm still doing cuts. People know I'm available to do cuts. I've, I've got a show next month um, doing cuts for somebody. So I'll still be in boxing in, in that respect. Hold on. What about your coaching ability? Uh, well, I'm not working at the Hatton Gym anymore uh, due to COVID. Um, yeah. And this, when I, when I finished there, I thought, well, I need to have a career change, if you like, to pay the bills because... There's not many paid boxing coaches about, as you know. You know, that was a, a one-off opportunity, which I was there nine years and it was it was great, but it come to an end. Mm -hmm. So just can't go get up and, and get moving, haven't you? But one of the other reasons I gravitate towards you, we've met on on cook courses and stuff was yeah, because yeah. of your philosophy around boxing and athlete safety, which has now become something that seems to, we've become desensitized by blood and the injuries you're now witnessing, not only in MMA, but boxing, bare knuckle and stuff like that, are, are more graphic, they're more horrific than ever before because of outside entity influences and in experience in corners as well, I have to say. Um, yeah. Because... You know, a lot of those injuries could end up, well, definitely plastic surgery is one one, uh, one, one option that has to be taken. But the other side of it is they could be career ending or deforming um, in yeah. terms of facial features and all the rest of it. Just give us a read. Remember you always said to me about athletes, your philosophy around athletes, how they come into boxing should be, how they leave boxing kind of thing. Well, the main thing is you've got to treat them like family and you've got to realise that Whatever money they earn from boxing, you want them to be able to enjoy it. You don't want them, want them not remembering who they are in 10 years. You know, they should come into the sport healthy and they should leave the sport healthy. Mm. And if you've got a bad injury, what could affect them down the line, you've got to pull them out of the fight. Yeah. It's, it's as simple as that. But and then what? Losers, we're nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so so it's one of them, you know. You've got to look after them because if you've got no boxers, you've got no no point in being there. And, the, and and one of the main things is, Mike, when you see kids out there with, with coaches, again, just bringing it back to, to non-boxing people or people with, with a lack of experience in corners and stuff like that, you know, um, you know, you scratch your head sometimes when you see the amount of punishment. I, I don't have the stomach for it anymore. The amount of punishment fighters taking sometimes just getting, you know, turfed off to stools and pushed back out to fight another round, which yeah. is probably the last thing they need. But, um, yeah, if that experience is not there, like, the, the the risk just goes up and up and up, you know. It's the hardest thing as a coach to pull a fight. Yeah. And I've, I've, had to, I've been there with Brian. Um, we went over to America when Robin Reed boxed Jeff Lacey. And he he got he got stopped. We stopped the fight, and it's it's quite a funny story. This, and I, I'm sure Robbie won't mind me mentioning it because we spoke about it. Uh, we went back to the hotel, and me and Robbie went up to our rooms to get something. And he said to me, "Mike, I could feel him tiring." I said, "Stop right there." I said, "Don't go blaming Brian. Blame me, Matthew All." 
And even the cameraman in the corner was like, stop the fight. I said, if he was getting tired, it was because of the amount of times he was putting you on the floor. Now, behave. And he, he just shrugged his shoulders, laughed. He went, fair enough. But you've got you've got to be honest with him. I could have said, oh, yeah, you, you, was, you would have come back and all that. But why try and be deluded about something as serious as that? But it is hard because you're going to win and you don't expect to get beat. Yeah. But you've got to realise when the time is right to pull a fight. So, uh, last but not least, I wanted to ask you, do you have any contact details now you have um, for your nutrition? For anybody that wants to get in contact with you with the... Um... No, I've not got a site up and running as yet, but I'm on Facebook as Mike Jackson. You can direct message me on there. And the and name of your nutrition, you're going you're gonna to hook up. So your Facebook... Yeah, yeah, it's going to be called Marshall Sports Nutrition, but you can get hold of me on Facebook, um, and I will, I will reply. Under what name on Facebook, Mike? Mike Jackson. Okay, Instagram. No, I'm only on Facebook. Okay, I, can't, Facebook. I, was on I need to get back on all the platforms. I know that, and that's yeah. what I'm in the process of doing. Yeah. Well, look. I wish you the very best for it, and I know you'll do well because you, you you're a doer. You get stuff done, and you never sit still. And of one thing I know, in the short period of time we've been going back and forth and chatting and stuff and walking together briefly, um, I, I I know you just you never stop. You never sit still, and with that kind of attitude, you'll always you know hard work always pays. It always pays, you know. Yep. One the other kind of thing. You mentioned Brian. I could say you one story before you go. Um... Come on, give it to me. Yeah. It was a funny one. We was, we was in Cardiff with Gary Lockett and Tony Doherty and his, my phone went uh, and it was his wife, Rosemary, and she said, we well, put Brian on. So I put him on and he said, get away. He said, throw it in the bin. So I'm listening. So he finished the call. So I said, what's that? He said, she's telling me there's a letter there from Buckingham Palace, all fancy writing on the front. I said, all oh, right. He said, it would be that like Thomas McDonough. I'll wring his bloody neck when I get back. Anyway, she, she didn't listen to him. She left it on the side. He went home, and sure enough, it was an invitation for him to collect his MBE. And he's, he's oh, telling cool. me in the bin. <laughs> but, but that's, that's what he was like. He, he wasn't a big head. He, he didn't for one minute think he would get that award. But that's amazing. It was, uh, it was well deserved. And, yeah. you know, he, he was a funny fella as well. He had a really good sense of humour. So yeah. I couldn't have learned off anyone better. No. And I, I can just I can sense, I, I can just sense the amount of respect you have for him as well. Oh, well, Mike, nah, thanks very much for doing not it. Just me, everyone, everyone in boxing, yeah. I think. Everybody, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks very much for doing this. <laughs>